Well, do you remember the good old days when banks were there to help you save money while interest rates continue to be stuck at historic lows? Finweek went out to find out where there were uh, traditional or any traditional saving, uh, saving vehicles that financial advisors would recommend that still carry the title of guaranteed return products. So for more on these recommendations, to delve into some options for you, Craig Gradage, Director of Investments at uh, uh, GM Investments, and then Graham Wood, Senior Financial Advisor at Old Mutual. Thank you both for joining us today. Um, as always, let's start off with this topic because I suppose it is topical this week, given the fact that we saw rates yesterday being kept on hold at 5%. What it reminds us is how low rates are, and it's tough to beat inflation these days. Sure. I mean, I think this, we were having a discussion off air is that, you know, inflation numbers came out this week. Uh, this week, and I think it's 5.9%. And, and you think, okay, 5.9% doesn't sound that extreme. It's at the upper end of the inflation uh, band that they've been, that the Reserve Bank's been promoting. But I think if we all look at real inflation in our own lives, is education inflation, medical inflation, the 5.9 is on the low end. Mm -hmm. So we, we kind of started looking around at where do people put their money these days? You know, all, you've talked to most asset managers, and they say equities are the only game in town. And while I understand the mantra that this is wh what they're saying from a long-term perspective, you know, if you were holding blue chips or blue chip like African Bank this week, I mean, you've been absolutely obliterated mm. in the last month. Um, the, the so what we went out, we said, are there ways, innovative ways, that people could find? products where you know in the good old days you had a money market where you could stick some money away you kind of generated nice interest at least you beat inflation it doesn't happen anymore so we kind of started looking around and seeing where do you put money are there some things that you can do that can be quite innovative that'll guarantee that in 12 months time you should have more money than you had before mm -hmm. and it was quite fun to put together so there we go i mean it's a start off with you graham i mean what are your thoughts right now on the investment horizon uh, that mark has put on the table one year well, I mean, the markets are high. I mean, the JSC is at a record level. It, it hit record levels about 40 times last year. Uh, when is it going to stop? Uh, is it going to correct? Not sure. Um, markets are looking good around the world. Interest rates are low. Uh, so equity, as far as I'm concerned, is a more attractive destination than money market that is delivering a return that's less than inflation. So your money is not retaining its purchasing power. Um, that said, uh, even on a one-year basis right now, mm. given the fact that uh, we know our market in South Africa, although we've had a bit of a shaky week up and down, but overall we are teetering mm. around record highs. Look, if you're a one-year investor, you shouldn't be taking too great a risk anyway. You have to be realistic. Um, if you're going into property and shares, you should be giving it a longer-term time horizon. Um, if you are needing the money within the year, you've got to uh, lead on the side of caution. Um, so yeah, there I would say that if I, it was my money and I was needing it within a year, I would be taking the view of more money market, mm -hmm. but accepting that I'm not going to be getting impressive growth. Yeah. I mean, it's tough to put your money into a money market fund knowing uh, that you're actually going to have less money in terms of real purchasing power in one year's time. So how do you deal with that fact? Yeah, that's a challenge. I mean, 12 months is not an investment horizon in our mm -hmm. opinion. Uh, you know, you, you're just saving. Um, Investment, you, you have to look at a minimum of three years, five years, and the longer the better, because then you can take on more investment risk, which converts to return over time. So on a 12-month view, your options are really limited, uh, as Graham mentioned. Uh, cash, depending on the kind of liquidity you need, retail savings bonds, uh, you may be able to get a bit of a, a pickup on you know, a slightly higher yield than what, what you're getting in the bank. Mm -hmm. Or you could take a small bet on a conservatively managed uh, real return fund, uh, which has a risk benchmark of protecting your money on a 12-month basis, mm -hmm. which then at least gives you the opportunity or the potential of getting uh, higher returns. So funds like that have delivered about anywhere between 10 and 15 percent over the last year. But uh, there's a very strong risk man a downside uh, objective as well. Mm. So th that could perhaps be the best place if, if you're comfortable with making no return over the year. But these uh, moderately conservative funds are employing equity, and equity has had a good run mm -hmm. bar uh, resources. So, I mean, if you look at the defense of stable funds, they've been de uh, delivering real returns of 6 to eight percent in some instances and they talk about a time horizon of 12 months seeking a real return of four percent but we are in good 
uh, economic times at the moment in terms of what equity has been delivering. Mm -hmm. um, it almost needs to disconnect what you're saying there though because mm -hmm. good economic times have almost uh, eluded us to a degree in terms of the strength of the you know, recovery but it's equities which have been driven also by other fundamentals in mm -hmm. terms of you know, global liquidity. Cheap credits, yeah. yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, but if you, mm -hmm. if you look at those funds over rolling one year periods uh, during the height of the financial crisis uh, many of these funds gave you a positive return. So mm -hmm. despite very bad markets, many of them did achieve the objective. The stable defences we're talking about. This kind of, yeah, the stable defences, whether they low uh, sta stable fund or absolute return fund or real return fund. Mm -hmm. uh, so, some, some gave you a negative return, but, but some did manage to protect your capital. I think this is where I start to get a little bit cynical. I know that I mean we've had some discussions around it, the way a lot of these funds are marketed or created. You have absolute return, you have balanced defence. they get all these fancy titles that essentially imply they're going to protect your capital. How do you, as, as a financial advisor, how do you kind of weigh up and look at these products that are kind of, that, that, that in theory are offering you a defensive portfolio that's supposed to at least protect your capital on a rolling 12 month? I mean, th in a lot of cases, you're not always sure what you're buying in that instance. Yeah, you, if your advisor has done his homework, mm -hmm. um, so you, you, you look at the mandate, uh, you look at the track record on rolling 12 month periods, um, to see what, what the manager's track record has been. I think a lot of people tend to look at the upside, the positive returns, yep. and kind of go for the best one and completely ignore risk. Mm -hmm. um, so on a one-year view, risk is, is probably more of an important objective than, than return. And also you're not working with much with one year. I yeah. mean, the investor has to be realistic. I mean, um, if, if you take great risk, let's say an investor took great risk in December, 2008 and they needed the money at the end of 2009 I mean they lost a lot of value on their capital mm -hmm. and they would have accepted that loss because they needed to sell the exposure to get the money out for whatever purpose but had they had the luxury of time on their side to wait for it to recover it would have been they, a beautiful have situation there but today. the thing is you know one year is it's not realistic there's not mm. much you can do and, and if a client comes to me and they say they need the money within a year I say look um, there are inherent built-in costs reduction in yield which is administration fee, asset management fee, advisor fee. Mm -hmm. uh, depending on who the client is, maybe they've got other products with me. Uh, I don't want to let them down on their products. So I'll waive my fees on the one year because it's, it's not a long time horizon. We may be looking at other business opportunities from the client in the future. So I want them to be satisfied with what happens over a year. But I am uncomfortable with a one year investment. I would prefer uh, it going into a fixed deposit. Um, or possibly an income fund that seems to be very consistent, predictable. If you look at, at income funds from mm -hmm. the likes of Coronation Strategic Income, I'm from Old Mutual, so maybe I shouldn't be mentioning them, Old Mutual Real <laughs> Income, um, yeah. they're very predictable. They, they, f they follow straight line ascendancy. And what type of assets do they invest in? Well, Typically. I would imagine that they're probably, I mean, I'm not an asset manager, yeah. I'm an advisor, yeah. okay? I would imagine that they're employing uh, bonds, uh, which is quite predictable, mm -hmm. probably property shares, which of the, the share sector is more defensive than, than some of the other sectors, small caps, uh, resource being quite volatile. Um, so yeah, I would say they'd be taking a more defensive strategy mm -hmm. uh, so as to achieve it because at the end of the day, um, the pensioner needs a predictable income. It can't be a roller coaster where they're not sure what's going to happen from one month to the next. Yeah. That income needs to appreciate because cost of living is rising. Yeah. You mentioned a very important aspect of things to look at at this point in time, and that's risk, and yeah. that people tend to ignore that when you're looking at funds. So, so how do you then build that into your uh, kind of uh, into your assessment criteria when you're looking at certain funds? I mean, do do you look at funds that have had you know least volatile? Do you look at funds that have lost the least amount of money? I mean, what are the key criteria you look at when it comes to risk? Yeah, you you, you look at the performance of funds through various cycles. You know, so it's the up cycle and the down cycle. And you have certain managers that have a very strong downside bias. Uh, RCM comes to mind, Alan Gray come to mind. Um, and they, they're out there, they're blowing their trumpet of, you know, protect capital at all costs. Uh, and compounding really works when you're compounding positive numbers. So that's in their philosophy, it's in their DNA. So if you've got a client of uh, very conservative, you're gonna tend towards managers and mandates like that. But I think the other important thing at the moment, which Graham alluded to, um, is, is expectation management. Mm 
Uh, you know, I think Warren Buffett said that the key to a successful marriage is having low expectations. And I think the key to successful investing is, is similar as well. Because if you look in that low risk space, you've got fantastic returns over the last year and the last two years. Mm -hmm. and, and so what you're seeing at the moment is our clients in, in cash and clients in bank uh, deposits looking at these fantastic returns coming out of low risk funds double digit returns and they're coming in with those expectations and even if they get 7% next year which is probably a normal return mm -hmm. they're going to be they're going to be disappointed and that's where you invested and they might then move their money again which of course is one of the worst things you can do exactly yeah You've got some other options though here, Mark, yeah. and one of them is being uh, asking for a raise, which is not always easy, but you say yes, you know, you need to be at inflation at least. Sure. So, I mean, I'll quickly run through the ideas very yeah. simply. The, the first one was actually ask for a raise. I think that, you know, a lot of companies have gotten into this habit of they, they put through f between 4 and 6% increases, and everybody kind of gets blanketed with this. But, you know, how interesting it is when somebody actually pushes back a little bit. I mean, you, you know, we all laugh at NUM going and asking for 60% increases. But, you know, they were saying corporate profits uh, since 1994, I think, have increased 250% on average. Real salaries have decreased over the same point by 7%. So companies are becoming more successful. Uh, it, it, it's not quite as easy as simply saying, well, companies make more money, therefore employees should make more money. Mm -hmm. But if you go in with a good argument to why you should at least be earning an, inc an inflation-linked increase, is the company's going to find it very difficult in, to um, reject that application, uh, re reject the, the, the idea. Uh, one of the other ideas was looking at preference shares. So, I mean, preference shares are an interesting asset class at the moment because mm -hmm. they're obviously linked to interest rates. Um, but a couple of them, um, Invicta and Brait in particular, were actually at one point offering greater than Prime, um, which is not a bad return on your, uh, you ba so and if interest rates do rise, obviously we've got this debate at the moment about what happens with interest rates at the moment um, in the short term. But if they do rise, mm -hmm. you're basically going to get the capital appreciation plus the interest rate appreciation, which you know turns into a good good return. Um, there was quite a cool idea from uh, Robert Cowan Investments, basically by Cecil. Um, it's basically your hedge against the the. Um, uh, the, the petrol price and the, and the whatever's happening in the currency market at the moment. And then lastly, and I mean this may be one to check to the financial advisors, is yeah. just know your basics of tax. I mean th there are a lot of mistakes that people do where they can actually get, make sense with investments, whether it's just putting money into an RA and actually getting the tax benefits mm -hmm. back. So there we go, let's put that on the table. Well, I, mean, I mean, when it comes to tax, how important is it that your clients look at their uh, w options to actually benefit from, from the tax system? Well, just sorry, just to go back on the SASL, if you are yeah. going to go and share like that, it's not going to be a one-year investment. That, that's going to be a 10-year plus investment. Um, and obviously, there's a need for certain shares, uh, companies that even in good times and bad times, they're going to perform. Um, but in terms of uh, tax efficiency, SARS extends tax benefits breaks to us. And a lot of people don't uh, take advantage of them. For instance, a retirement annuity, if you don't belong to a pension provident fund, a, a company retirement fund, uh, you can contribute up to 15% of your income into a retirement annuity um, and that would be tax deductible. And the way I look at that is a three-way gain. One, discipline savings, money that you're not spending now, that, mm -hmm. that's there for the long term. It's compounding if the appropriate asset manager is taken and we in South Africa have very good asset managers and that growth is tax exempt um, and and the third reason it's, it's tax deductible so right. it's discipline savings long-term tax exempt compound growth tax deductible um, income protection disability is another uh, product that comes to mind which is about investment here but um, if something was to happen to you and you are unable to continue doing your job if you uh, developed an injury or illness that rendered you unable to work, uh, where's your income going to come from? And uh, if you've got a product like that, the premium for the income protection is tax deductible too. Mm -hmm. um, great, great, great. What, any ideas from your side in terms of benefiting from the tax system, tax efficiency, and I suppose uh, also from a business owner's perspective, there's uh, incentives there. Yeah, look, uh, it, it doesn't quite tie up with the 12-month investment horizon. Yeah. Uh, so your, your tax benefits... But it does make sense to look at it now before you pay tax yeah, next year. I think, I think the important point way. is that you make use of all the tax exemptions that you've yeah. got first. Yeah. So, so what you see is clients being put into uh, term products where they tax within the fund and they've been told it's an after-tax product, but the exemptions would have prevented them from paying the tax in any case. Um, 
and you know your medical aid, your RAs, your income protection, all of that. Uh, a property, you know, you can write off the interest uh, on, on your tax. So the important thing is see a tax specialist and make sure that you're making use of all the exemptions you're entitled to. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it, it kind of clashes with the, the topic of a 12-month Sure, but I think it is, it's part of approaching finance over a one-year period where you say, uh, here's an easy win for somebody, and it's a simple thing of com compiling a logbook or making sure you actually can claim back your tax. I think it's part of, if you, if you view it on a one-year basis, mm -hmm. yeah. just like if you have an FD running a company, you want to be as run as tax efficiently as possible. But and it's an easy win for you. You're also touching on that one-year investment. I mean, that's a flexible investment, so it's going to be subject to tax as well, the growth. And if you, under the age of uh, 65, your interest exemption is 23,800 Rand per annum. So any interest over and above that will form part of your um, taxable income. So then maybe it's, it's good to get into an absolute return fund or a defensive stable fund that is talking towards a, a 12 month rolling period mm -hmm. uh, of stability, but also striving to deliver a real return because then it's not all going to be a money market bonds there will be some equity there yeah. and obviously the dividend growth from the equity is subject to 15 percent dividend withholding tax which is paid over by the financial services provider mm -hmm. so it, it, it could be more tax efficient uh, as well just to be yeah. more than just money market but it depends on the expectations because if you've got a nervous investor who's calling you at 11 o'clock at night it does happen because i see red marks on the tv and bad news um you know, it's not good for their health to be <laughs> worrying about what's happening from each day. They're going to make bad decisions. Then I just go, <laughs> money market, money. fixed deposit. Yeah. But if the person understands and they, they're not going to be greedy, then an absolute return fund that's maybe looking uh, at a 12-month rolling period. Yeah. But a lot of them actually look at, at uh, three-year periods uh, would be yeah. more tax efficient.